Hello, everyone, and welcome to the COP28 Dialogues. It's Gender Equality Day as we gather for this Women Rise for All conversation at COP28. Women Rise for All is a platform dedicated to amplifying the transformative power of women's leadership as the world works to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. Today, we've gathered influential women climate leaders who have been instrumental in driving change and leading by example in our efforts to uphold the 1.5 target of the Paris Agreement, saving lives and securing livelihoods. My name is Anne Marie. I'm the executive director of the UN Office for Partnerships. And let's start with a message from the Deputy Secretary General, Amina Mohammed. Dear friends, colleagues, and the viewers from Dubai and around the world, it's a pleasure to join you today. Our journey with Women Rise for All began in April 2020 during a global pandemic that laid bare the profound challenges of our world, from escalating inequalities to worsening climate impacts. In the face of these challenges, a new paradigm of leadership emerged, one that reflects the values of the United Nations and aligns with the Sustainable Development Goals. This leadership is characterized by compassion, collaboration, openness to innovate, solutions, and an unwavering commitment to leaving no one behind. Women Rise for All serves as a catalyst for this transformative approach. In every sector, remarkable women embody this leadership daily. By identifying and uniting these trailblazers, we amplify their impact and values. Friends, women stand at the forefront of the climate battle, whether as scientists, legislators, indigenous leaders, or youth activists. They are fighting to keep the 1.5 degrees Celsius target alive, bringing solutions, saving lives, and protecting livelihoods. Women continue to drive ambitious climate action and more than everywhere, including in their communities, cities, countries, and regions. Their unique skills and perspectives hold the power to reshape the climate conversation, opening doors to collaborative opportunities. For meaningful progress, women in all their diversity must have equal leadership roles at decision-making tables where climate challenges and solutions are discussed. At this COP28, leaders will be considering the Global Stock Take and the Loss and Damage Fund. Your voice will be key to ensuring we get the ambition we need to send signals to the front lines for the next five years. As you engage in dialogue today, let your words reignite our collective energy for the task at hand, securing a livable planet by delivering on our Paris commitments to mitigation, adaptation, and finance. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Secretary General, for this motivating call to action. Joining me today are four inspiring leaders, Aisha Siddique, UN Secretary General's Youth Advisor on Climate Change, Umi Gay, award-winning Senegalese musician and activist, Melanie Nakagama, Chief Sustainability Officer at Microsoft, and Tasneen Asap, Executive Director of Climate Action Network. Welcome and thank you for being with us. Um, let's set the context. I'd like each of you to share one of the top issues that you're tracking at COP. Let's start with Tasneen. Well, for this COP, we really tracking uh, the outcomes for an energy package. So last year, we were, well, for the past two COPs, we were pushing on the loss and damage fund. And we're really pleased that through our collective efforts, we managed to get that through and across the line. This year, we have to deal with the causes of the climate crisis. We dealt with the consequences. Now we need to deal with the causes. And for this COP, we would want to see an outcome on the phase out of fossil fuels and of course the phase in of renewables, but very importantly also the financing for that kind of just transition to get out of fossil fuels and into clean energy. That's what we're tracking, that's what we're putting pressure <laughs> on at this COP and that is the big one for us this year. Thank you, Tasneen. Melanie, what are you tracking? It's a great segue. Uh, we're tracking how quickly our policymakers and governments and partnerships coming together to accelerate the clean energy transition. We know we need to move faster at the speed and scale. And so how are country governments and their partnerships coming together to actually put in place the actions that are going to make us go faster? Speed and scale. I love it. What are you tracking? 
So we're tracking up the COP28, 20, uh, the impact of the climate change in women and children, especially in a place like the Sahel. Uh, what are we doing for, for women and children at this place? How can we help us for having a better, a better life and a better situation? Last but not least, what are you tracking? Um, I'm going to echo this name. We are tracking, in particular, a fossil fuel phase out, uh, not a, not just a phase down. And in addition to that, on climate finance, the taxation of oil and gas. Aisha, you just mentioned the phase out, not phase down. Mm. Um, what can women leaders do to support this effort? Um, it's not just about what women leaders can do to support this effort. The fossil fuel industry is impacting the day-to-day -day lives of young women and girls everywhere. So it is not just a, a battle cry. This is directly impacting the lives. And what women and girls can do is what we have been doing, which is advocacy. Um, but in addition to that, being involved in renewable projects and, and just transition projects in your local communities and, and um, nationals, national uh, delegations. It takes all kinds of voices and we all need to play a role. Umi, as an artist and an activist, what is your hope and motivation in driving climate action, especially as you were saying for women and girls in regions that are being left behind, like the Sahel? My motivation, I, uh, I'm gonna tell that is because I am always impacted directly by the, the climate change. So it's a personal story. Uh, when I was young, I was playing in my grand grandparents' house and the advancing of the sea destroyed the house. So uh, with that, I, I, I want to say to every little girl, I want for every little girl to not leave their story, to, to get better life and to, 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 to know how to, to do for, for helping another little girl. So it's my hope for, for that uh, COP28. Thank you so much, Umi. Yeah. Melanie, as chief, sustainability, as chief of sustainability at Microsoft, you have an important perspective that shows the intersection of the private sector and sustainable action. Could you share how you and other women leaders are using your platforms to advance climate ambition for everyone everywhere? I say there are three ways that myself and so many other countless women leaders on sustainability are doing this. The first way is as collaborators. We're partnering together to actually build the networks and the engagements that are actually gonna help drive the actions we wanna see. That's speed and scale, it starts with a collaboration. The second area is as change agents. You know, I'm surrounded by change agents here. This is a real opportunity for women and girls is to be change agents to talk about what's happening with the climate crisis and the private sector is a great way to bring technology, innovation, financing to the table to actually help truly be change agents to help move the, the world, these negotiations, the process forward to really tackle the goals that are listed in the Paris Agreement. And the third area is you can be a collaborator, you can be a change agent, but you also have to be a really strong communicator. And that's the other area where I see a lot of my colleagues and my peers. We're here at COP28 trying to talk about what we in the private sector are doing to put in place actions and measures that our companies are doing. For Microsoft, we're trying to become carbon neutral, carbon negative by 2030, water positive and zero waste. And so really be able to communicate these messages to hopefully inspire others to join. Inspire others to join. This is like one of those key er you know, areas that we're trying to do in, in, from the very beginning in civil society have been really advocating for in communities. How do you come to consensus, um, Tesneen? How do you bring people together on some of these issues? especially around what you've just talked about, um, an, in, a, a sound energy that, that respects and embraces climate justice? Well, we are a very diverse network in over 130 countries. We've got over 1,900 members. And of course, that would be challenging. But I think there's a few things. One, there's a value system that unites us. There are key principles that unite us. So the issue of fighting for and working for justice, not only climate justice, justice across the board, unites us. And secondly, we base many of our policy positions on science, what the science is saying, it has to be evidence-based, and fundamentally about equity. And part of that building of consensus is a deep recognition that all our contexts differ and having respect for that and understanding where everybody, you know, their starting points are, respecting that and building 
from that place. So the network is exciting because we're able to build consensus. We very rarely have massive differences. We iron these things out. Um, and again, women have played a very key role in ensuring that the, converse, the difficult conversations are held, that we build that consensus in the network. And so certainly it's very important that we don't set aside conflict, if I can call it that. You put it on the table, you have the hard conversation, and then you build consensus. I love what you just said there. And I want to know if anyone would like to react to it, to any of what anyone has said so far, especially around Nazi, about coming together on the tough issues. Um, I think around women and girls in particular, um, especially because I am surrounded by the youth movement, which is predominantly young women and girls, um, I have learned the real definition of resilience. Um, and resilience is intergenerational among women, especially uh, like you were mentioning your personal narrative. When climate disasters occur, when um, women are forced to flee, uh, when families are forced to flee, women take charge. Um, in my country of Pakistan just last year, we had a massive flood that displaced 60 million people. Of those 60 million, predominantly were women and young girls. And we saw that to get bread and water, women were the ones going outside of their makeshift camps to feed their children. Um, young girls were taking charge of their entire families after having been orphaned. And we also see this in war-torn countries and uh, displacement that is occurring across the world. 80% of the people affected by the climate crisis are, are women. So um, to add to this conversation, and the reason why the role of women is important, not just from the political end, but really in communities, they teach us resilience. I think, uh, so I'm a mother, and I think I can just speak for my children. I can have hard conversations. And I think the idea that women play in this conversation is the ability to have the hard conversations and speak the truth around these difficult issues and really bring a sense of honesty and authenticity to the conversation, which is really important, I think, as we grapple with these really difficult challenges around how are we going to move to a 1.5 aligned future, it's going to require really difficult decisions but also incredible opportunity. And so to be able to hold both of those ideas of both the optimism and the sobriety in one hand, I think is really important. It's a crucial role that we all play, and it's a role that, that corporations play in the mix as well, is to be able to demonstrate where that opportunity lies in driving those solutions forward, but also being able to grapple that with the opportunities that also come from the challenges. I think when you talk about um, bringing those difficult issues to the table, it's, it helps build trust, to have these conversations, to put everything on the table and to be um, open about it. And we may not come to consensus right away, but if we don't try, we will never get there. Um, which kind of brings me to this other part, which is investment. Um, why should we be investing in women's leadership in, in climate action? What do you, I mean, as climate leaders yourselves, what, are, what is that return on investment that you've seen? Anyone want to jump in? <laughs> so I think that women have a greatest sense of collaboration. We see it here. And we have the sensibility to pay attention uh, to the problem. We, co we communicate more. And we can, we can find a lasting solution, I, I think. I love that, lasting yeah. solutions. Nazneen? Yeah, well, I, I mean, look, we've just heard Aisha say the critical role that women play just across the board, right? And the resilience that they bring with that. And often that's not valued by society. It's not valued in the political space. It's not valued. And so investing more and more in women, in women, their abilities, and here, not only as Aisha says, you know, to become uh, political leaders, but on the ground, that leadership of women has to be recognized. And investing in that will scale, you know, what uh, uh, you were saying earlier about the speed and the scale of things, that investment will bear fruits at all levels. Uh, the more you empower women through investing in them on the ground gives you, because I'm a firm believer that change happens through the power of people. And when we talk about the power of people, it's essentially the power of women. And so that's where we need to invest. If I may add, um, this is a bit of a spiritual answer, but this is something that 
my elders have taught me, um, women are connected to life fundamentally. Um, uh, Childbearing women are connected to the void that brings the spirit into the body and spirit into the world. And therefore, they're also connected to the, the, the beginning of life. And the fight for climate justice, the, flight, the fight for um, a sustainable world is a fight for life, all forms of life, keeping it alive. And therefore, I think uh, for that reason, this is more than just personal, it's spiritual. There's no choice between people and planet. Um, they have to come together. And you have all brought such interesting points. And we're going to do a traditional close for, that we do for the dialogues um, around sustainable development, which is give me one word that you're feeling now here at COP. Um, I'm going to start with. Actually, I want to say something, um, and it's not one word. This COP has been particularly painful. And our Deputy Secretary General spoke about women and compassion. And this COP, unfortunately, the disconnect between what's going on in this space and what's going on 2,500 kilometers away from us pains. I think it pains us collectively as women. Um, and so I would say, for me, this COP, pain and painful. Melanie? You know, I think there's, you, you call attention to really important issues about what comes into these global conversations. And so, um, in addition to recognizing that, you know, the other, the other space that I find with this COP is there is, having been in these process for a very long time, we talked about when I started in the climate negotiations, the other part that I do start to begin to feel is a bit more inspiration around potential opportunities for positive outcomes that we can all achieve. The, the amount of people that are here and the amount of discussions and robust conversation um, does in, you know, inspire in me what comes after this for, for myself and my peers and others of what is possible as, we, as the calendar rolls into the new year and we start to look at, we move from the halfway point in the SDGs to the, what comes now, next after this halfway point. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say hope, hopeful, uh, because we got the platform to, to talk about the situation in the Sahel, especially the situation, who, uh, the situation of women and children, so hope. Aisha? Heartbreak. <laughs> Utter heartbreak. Um, there's a poem by Rumi that um, gives a little bit of consolation, which is, he says to the beloved, break my heart break my heart again so I can learn how to love more deeply. And I feel like I come to these cops just to have my heart broken. But what teaches me love is the community again. Okay, I've got like little goosebumps going all over me. What you've all said and shared is so heartfelt from, and I think very from the very beginning is that leadership that leaves no one behind and that remembers everyone in our in our thinking and in our actions, and how do we support each other. I really want to just thank all four of you for being with us. Um, I'm going to add the word collaboratives. We've said it a couple of times, and for me it means we can't do it alone. We've just seen this. We need to be together, and we need to go forward together, and we need to find all of those things, the communication, um, the change that we're looking for, being able to support each other um, and think about multiple things at, mul at the same time and work on them all. Um, when again, thank you so much. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining us at this COP28 dialogue in Dubai and around the world. Let's apply these insights, ideas for people and planet and support women climate leaders if you'd like to learn more about Women Rise for All, and I'm underlining the all, please follow the links on the screen. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.